Welcome to Ice Coffee Hour. We are Wall Street Bets. What an introduction. <laughs> Thanks so much. That's great. <laughs> You're very welcome. How we are, are you guys? We are in the presence, I think, of uh, greatness here. Mm. I hope so. Well, I'm <laughs> equally as uh, happy to be here and equally as thrilled. Thank you so much. So uh, tell us a little bit about your story, uh, the creation of Wall Street Bets, your involvement, how this came to be, a little bit about the backstory of everything. So I started Wall Street Bets about 10 years ago, give or take, right? Like I've been a serial entrepreneur my whole life, right out of college. I've had some really successful companies. I've had some big flops, right? But I, uh, in the, well, one of the companies that I sold ended up being uh, a paper millionaire company, right? Like it was just this great deal. It was the first one that I'd started from college and it turned out that a lot of those papers ended up being useless, right? And so I was like, all right, clearly I'm missing a finance component. Mm -hmm. right? Started getting the finance, studying it. You know, I got myself a job at a big multinational bank and, uh, and make a decent money. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to keep my 401k. I'm going to do my typical retirement, but I'm going to put my extra money to work, right? And it's so looking for places online that was... Uh, condu uh, condu conductive or conducive to higher risk trading, right? Like mm -hmm. for these things that I can win the lottery overnight and just retire happy. Uh, but there was no place like that. It was either like conventional, diversified, low commission ETF type investing or, or professional traders, right? These are people that just do like look at charts all day long. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to have some fun. So I started Wall Street Bets. Now, when you mean you started Wall Street Bets, we're talking about the subreddit. Correct. On Reddit? Well, it was a whole, yeah. yeah. So it was a subreddit on Reddit. That's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. And, and the, what do you call it? Twitter account, like YouTube, you know, like I, the, the platforms, there was a lot of different ones. I wasn't sure which one was going to be the one that was going to grow. Right. And mm -hmm. so the, uh, the subreddit was the one that ended up just organically growing. Right. Like people often ask me, how did you grow it so much? And it was just people were interested in it. Yeah. Right. Like it was. Now, why create a community? Why wouldn't this just be you having fun by yourself, maybe with some buddies and a, you know, texty back and forth a little bit? Why create a community around that? Because I don't know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> like, I know what the stocks are. I know what the stock market is. And I started looking at stock options. I'm like, these are cool, right? Like, they go up and down really fast with yeah. really little money. So I'm hoping somebody can give me some tips, right? Like, it was just wanting to learn and also wanting to share that with somebody and uh and wall street bets ended up attracting a perfect mix of both well, not professionals but people that really know what they're doing and people that really want to learn what they're doing and uh, made a wonderful combination right so you were just looking for high risk places to put your money in and you were doing yolo bets and stuff like that and then you wanted to make a community around it effectively yeah i mean i would like i don't know which one it was a chicken or the egg situation but i wanted to do high risk. It wasn't like so much YOLO bet. It was, I want to get rich quick, right? Which, <laughs> which requires yeah. YOLO, you know, like risk and return are the same thing. And so if I'm going to get a scratch off lottery ticket, this is at least more fun. I can do it from my phone. Uh, back in the day, they wasn't commission free. They were just low commission uh, brokers that were just starting to kick out. So I was like, oh, cool. This is a couple bucks. Like when I first invested in the stock market, it was $30 to buy shares and $30 to sell them. Yeah. Again. What brokerage is that? That was, I, I don't remember, but I was using like Wachovia's, but it was called Wachovia, now it's Wells Fargo. Yeah. It was acquired multiple times, but it was just through like the bank. <laughs> was like we have to call up a guy on the phone. The fashion, right? like, <laughs> Jim, place this trade for me. That's pretty much how it was. But then the, the, the broker that I used to use a lot was Options House, which then turned into E-Trade. Mm -hmm. But it was just, you know, like eventually... When I start off with a little capital, I have this rule called the uh, pattern day trader. You need to have 25 grand in order mm -hmm. to do multiple trade, like lots of day trades. And I didn't have 25 grand. So I was like, uh, I'm going to use this broker and then I'm going to get that broker and then I'm going to use that broker. So that every time I yeah. open a new, there's no rule that says how many brokers you can have. So right. That, yeah, and it's something that people still do today. That's at, crazy. At the time, was that a sizable amount of money for you that you were, you know, putting in, you know, call options I, you and know, stuff like, like that. You know, like I was probably putting a couple thousand. Like I, uh, I, th I think I might've funded the account with either 10 or 20 grand, right? But it was just, all right, let's see, let's see what I'm willing to do. Like anything over 25, I think that was just a psychological barrier. And the word pattern day trader was like, man, I have to click more little boxes. It says I really need to know what I'm doing. I'm gonna yeah. get into like uh, <laughs> above my water. But yeah, it, you know, like in the fluctuations that take place when you 
when you're taking such high risk trades, especially with stock options, like I would make 20 grand and then I would lose 40 grand and I would like refill the machine <laughs> with more money. <laughs> Very appropriate now that yeah. I'm in Vegas, I'm like, okay, game over and like play again and then just keep going up. And probably ended up breaking even, probably lost money uh, during the first few years, but sure. it was just a wild, great learning experience. How much were you making back then? You're working full time, right? Yeah, I was yeah. probably making 150 grand. Okay. So, and I was single. I didn't have, you know, any dependents. Like I had a nice car, but I preferred to take the metro to work, right? Mm -hmm. So like I really my expenses were pretty much rent, right? And, uh, and and I could afford to take whatever risk I wanted to. But at the same time, were you also investing in like, you know, ETFs and stuff like that? No. Oh, well, sorry. In my Roth IRA, uh, yeah. Like so you had a Roth IRA. Account, yeah, 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 yeah. That was through my employer. They do the whole matching thing right. or whatever. But everything on top of that was just. Yeah, I would do I would do stock options on the s and I would do stock options sure. on the NASDAQ, yeah. <laughs> what was community like back then? At what point did it grow to like the first 10,000 people or, or the point where you knew that this is its own community separate from everything else? There's a lot of moments throughout the time. So like I start this thing off and I, well, first I register, right? Then I take a few months kind of trying to decide exactly how it's going to look and what it's going to be about. And then I finally announce it like five, six months mm -hmm. later and on, on similar subreddits and on my Twitter with six followers and on whatever. And people started showing up and it would double in size pretty much every year, right? So like maybe from a thousand to two to four to eight. And then very soon you're at like 500,000, it turns to a million, all right? Like you start doubling things, they really grow fast. But it was it was immediately apparent when, when I could see kind of like the curve of yeah. uh, the growth. And then th there were moments where, where we say, ah, we've made it, right? I remember in, it was April Fools of 2004, for, no, it's 2015, I believe. Mm. Me and the other moths were just real jokesters, right? Like we had this keep it fun and keep it simple. And so for April Fool's Day, one of the moths <laughs> turned the, you know, you can change the interface. You can make it look however you want. And he put like, shifted the entire thing slightly so that it was just annoying where it made you think your screen was off and it would like Windows 95 type icons and it had these twirling we're like, really <laughs> and on that day, just serendipity, we had, uh, <clears throat> I want to say it's like fortune.com or one of those uh, big websites were saying, oh, okay, yeah, we're talking about volatility instruments, blah, blah, blah. And there's a forum where they think something, something's going to happen. And then the word forum was a link and he clicked the link and it took you straight to Wall Street Bets. So we were all excited because finally somebody saw Wall Street bets, right? But we were twice as <laughs> thrilled about the fact that this was on April Fool. So we could just imagine the number of people sitting at work, reading Fortune, clicking, <laughs> clicking the yeah. link and being greeted by these non-safe for work. <laughs> yeah. So how do you how do you monetize a subreddit? Because it's one thing to create a fun community as a, as a side hobby. But at what point are you able to turn that into a business or figure out a way to monetize that? Uh, you cannot monetize a subreddit, yeah. like by the rules, not by what efforts you can do, right? And so I was actually removed in 2020 because I wrote a book and I started this, well, I was before COVID created this kind of competitive day trading competition. That was the excuse as to why they removed me. Reddit never really told me, but there is a rule there that says you can, right? Um, not allowed to talk about the actual story because they're actually making a movie. I sold my life rights to a movie studio. And so they're going to be the ones that get to tell that story. Uh, but that's kind of a tangent. How do you monetize a brand? That is a different story, right? Like I have the trademark. I have, you know, I wrote the book and I have a gazillion different things under that umbrella uh, that is monetizable. So I guess the closest you could get to monetizing something on Reddit would be to create a brand and kind of grow an audience similar to the way that you would do this on YouTube or TikTok or whatever it might be and then kind of build it out that way. Sure. So Reddit is a policy against not directly monetizing a subreddit, but you could own the trademark I and do. then license the trademark. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's like a way around it. A no, bit. no, no. This is Kinda, something yeah. I've, I've, yeah, yeah. Like, I've spent a ton of time on this, right? Like it's really strange because you can have Coca-Cola or Under Armour or whatever brand you want, like that monetize it and, and then come to Reddit and they say, hey, this is my brand. We'd like to be able to, to uh, grow the community and get them involved and monetize this component of it, right? But if you start from scratch and say, this is my brand, like, or you want to turn it into one, 
then it get, gets kind of tricky. The rule is you cannot be paid to moderate. That's the actual rule, uh, which in my case, or whatever, I'm not going to talk about my case, right. but that's, um, yeah, that's the rule that's in place. Reddit turns around when they see a subreddit that starts uh, growing a lot, they turn around and try to trademark that name. They've done that with explain it like I'm five. They've mm. done it with like, a, I forget which ones they are. I know this because uh, currently in a battle with Reddit, they're not happy with my trademark of Wall Street mm. bets, right? But um, but it is kind of a really weird thing. I don't think Reddit thought it through when they first started it. I've been watching them forever. When they were really small, they're like, oh, this is really cool. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people come here, let's hold hands, kumbaya. And then they realize there's potential conflicts there. And yeah, if you have the trademark, specifically if you have the one that uh, involves internet forums and chat rooms and all type of social social networking then uh, then it gets interesting first we have to thank our sponsor helix sleep so i actually recently bought a house and i have to say i am so grateful for my helix sleep mattress seriously guys i moved in without even having a fridge without wi-fi and without even having like trash service but i made sure i did not move in without my helix sleep mattress why didn't you just stay at Graham's? Well, that's besides the point, Alex. Plus, I slept like a baby. The magic behind it is their sleep quiz. See, Helix knows everyone sleeps different. So if you guys head over to helixsleep.com slash coffee, you can take their sleep quiz in under two minutes and it will match you to the perfect mattress. When I took the quiz, I was actually matched with the Helix Plus, which is for plus size sleepers. That's the first time I've ever heard of any mattress made for plus size sleepers. So there really is a mattress out there for everyone. And they even have a 10 year warranty and you can also sleep on the mattress 100 nights risk free because if you don't like it, they'll come and pick it up for you. But guys, I promise you will love it. So revolutionize the way that you sleep with a mattress made for you. Right now they're actually giving $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. If you go to helixsleep.com slash coffee, that's helixsleep.com slash coffee, $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows. That's right helixsleep.com slash coffee. Thank you so much, Helix, for sponsoring this episode and back, back to, to the, the podcast. podcast. I'd almost imagine that Reddit now would have learned from uh, those experiences and just made it like a terms of the agreement where like by signing here uh, and making an account, you agree that anything you create on the site, it belongs to us. So I, I don't know if they so would you think that would this. discourage some people that are creating forums though from, no, from doing it? I don't think so at all because I think the people that create forums never do it for the intention of making money. I think you were a perfect example of that. You just created because you wanted to do it. I, I don't think that would discourage anyone from being like, oh, well, yeah, I can't yeah. monetize it. I'm not gonna make this community anymore. Yeah, And somebody else would. I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it is an interesting balance, right? Like, sure. so Reddit starts off as literally, let's just, uh, you know, I think that at one point they were taking donations. They just want it to be a great yeah. community. And I loved Reddit, right? Like still is a great platform and uh, back in 2000, 10 or so they organized this huge rally it wasn't right at the company but it was like the community that got together in washington dc where mm -hmm. i was living at the time they got together like a hundred thousand people and they filled up the um uh the national mall and they had this event with stephen colbert and the other guy john stewart and they had a bunch of celebrities on it was like wow this is really like this is a huge deal right and so reddit at that point kind of got involved with it uh and then all of a sudden big money starts rolling in. They, mm -hmm. you know, they, they sold it and they bought it back. And then now they're considering going public with this. And so I think their original model wasn't really a business model. It was more, this is for everybody, you know, by the people for the people type thing. And then eventually they're like, all right, well, we got to pay the servers. It's a lot of traffic. Yeah. We got to start doing some things. And then yeah. one thing led to the next. Now they want to do an IPO, which now forces their EBITDA, you know, the, the financial statements mm -hmm. to be nice and uh clean with that so they're still kind of maneuvering it but i don't think it's well defined right like it's a weird thing that you register a subreddit and then if it gets big then they subjectively go and try and get it right like there's a bunch of other ones like satoshi street bets and other yeah. ones where they don't seem to care about but couldn't they argue that that's for the benefit of let's say let's say i'm looking at that and finding like bitcoin bets let's just say that that's a subreddit i see it getting big I didn't create it, but I could go and register the trademark for that. Can't uh, can't just any random person go and do that? So it's better for Reddit to do that than some random. Yeah, rando I, and, look, I I get that yeah. point. I understand they want to they want to be able to protect it, right? Because especially if something gets big, like something like Wall Street bets, and that's pretty much a threat. 
Uh, trademark laws, thankfully, they're relatively fair, all right? So when you all go to trademark someone, they're going to be like, well, show me that you've used it, all right? Or show me that you have the intention to be used mm -hmm. if nobody's used it before. And as part of that process, uh, you know, one of the one of the final steps is they publish this trademark application to the world mm -hmm. and anyone that has any objections can come in and say, no, if you grant that person that trademark, that's going to harm my business. Got right. It. And so then that starts the whole process. Got it. So what are your thoughts now about how Wall Street Bets has evolved? Do you think today it's the same feeling or the, the same intention as it was back when you started it? Or do you think it's evolved and taken a life of its own and it's, and it's different from what you first had in mind? It's it's shifted uh, as it's grown, but it has a lot of things that still the, the, that are still the same, right? The community gets started, and it is a fun, honest, like brutally unapologetic place for people to 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 hang out and to learn. And so this is, you know, oftentimes I get the question like, so why do people brag about their losses and uh, on Wall Street Bets? I'm like, it's not so much that they're bragging, even if it looks like it. Maybe there is a little bit of kind of flexing there, but it's more this is real all right this is in the real world you you both win and lose money and in this case i got my ass handed to me so give me like a virtual hug right mm -hmm. and and uh and same thing like look how much money i made or sometimes look how much money i made and then look how much i just lost it again uh but this you know let's let's have fun it's just been no filter offensive uh, a lot of the times right there's just a lot of it, locker room banter right? it's been predominantly male for as long as i can remember so that that hasn't changed but it's started shifting like some of the some of the aspects of it which i wasn't happy with and still aren't is you have some of this unapologetic offensive speech turn into hate speech right and you st it starts to it becomes counterproductive or even though there's no political, like there's just here we're talking about stocks or betting or whatever, we're not deviating from this, including politics, right? Just to make uh, make this nice uh, silo of it, you, you know, people do start um, deviating in that direction. So some of that I think is because it's grown so much, mm -hmm. and so you have slightly less control. But the the overall tone of fun of really creative, really smart people that have come up. Wall Street Bets became real famous here with uh, GameStop, right? Mm -hmm. But as you know, because you had a podcast of, about this a couple years ago where these people took out infinite leverage, right? Like oh, the infinite margin yeah. cheat code, right? And prior to that, they had <laughs> done other stuff that was yeah. similar, like with the box spread. Like there's been really clever. These people come together and they say, let's exploit an inefficiency and they do that it was well. right. That was Wall Street Bets, mm -hmm. the Robin Hood infinite money glitch. Wow, that was the original. I completely forgot about that. Yeah, that was like two years ago. Jeez, I, I love that guy. We had him <laughs> on. So for those that uh, are not aware, this guy found a uh, a loophole in Robin Hood. Where I, I forget exactly how it worked, but he was basically, he was taking on margin. I think he was selling options or he's, he's, he was doing something with options and then selling those options. So Robin Hood gave him a credit back. But because he still has that position, but he got a credit back, Robin Hood then doubled his margin and he was able to do it again. And then he would double his margin again. And so with like two grand, he was able to get like $1.7 million worth of margin. And uh, the the downside with this is that it, it doesn't seem like I would play it smart. Like I think if you want $1.7 million worth of margin, at least do something where you have a high likelihood of making money. Because, you know, you have to pay it back at some point and they're going to learn about it. But it just seems so many people at that time were just making these ridiculous bets with like a one in a hundred chance of like being big. And then they would lose it and just delete the app. <laughs> and uh, uh, but you know what? Like I, I guess we could kind of talk about this now. It's been two years. Um, Robinhood. Uh, oh, I hope I could talk about. It. Anyway, sure, go for it. My understanding is that uh, Robinhood settled a lot of these cases for pennies on the dollar. So someone would owe like two million bucks, and Robin would be like, "Hey, just just we'll call it this amount. <laughs> you could pay us off over time. We'll call it even." Like. They got out good. But I think Robin Hood is afraid that uh, these people could lawyer up and be like, well, you allowed some 18-year-old kid to get on infinite margin in a way that your platform encouraged and allowed. He's not responsible for that loss that's a glitch on your platform. He doesn't have the money. Plus, here's the thing. When you're 19, you have no assets. You have no money to pay for. What are they going to collect? They have a judgment against you. 1.7. Oh, I, I'm bankrupt now. 
No, so and then what? they go on social media and talk about that, and yeah. all of a sudden they're the bad guys, like Robin so Hood is wrong. No, but you know what's interesting mm, about that? So, yeah. like, when I, you know, part of uh, when I started Wall Street Bets, I'm looking at, I'm on the heels of financial crisis, right? Like, I'd actually yeah. lost a job to the financial crisis. So, to some extent, I, you know, and I lived in DC where a lot of the Occupy Wall Street movement. So, I had all these things fresh on my mind. And I started learning about these things called leveraged ETFs. And these are like these exotic variety, which are just basically math formulas. And, and, and I was like, how can these things exist? And why are they legal? And didn't we just learn our lesson? This thing is. You know, the counterparty risk, and if you're not supposed to be able to share, sell short unless, you know, you have the collateral or experience, but you can buy an inverse ETF and somebody else has taken on the infinite risk and weird stuff, right? So I'm mad and I write this entire blog post and I was like, I'm going to publish this and the whole world is going to be just as outraged as me. But first, we have to thank our sponsor, Ritual. Protein powders can be extremely intimidating, especially with their very confusing ingredients list and also just like the overall perception of them. But fortunately, Ritual is here to shake things up. But the truth is we all need protein and it's not just for building muscle. We need it at a cellular level. So Ritual's team of scientists reimagine protein powder from the ground up. The result is a delicious plant-based protein offered in three premium formulations for distinct life stages and unique nutritional needs, all made with the same high standards approach and commitment to traceability that Ritual is known for. I personally take Ritual's daily shake powder every single day, twice a day. In the mornings, I mix it with my banana smoothie, and then before my workout, I dry scoop it. Jack, you don't dry scoop it. I've seen you mix it with your oat milk. Well, I, I have dry scooped it, but th come on, dude. That's besides the point. So why not shake up your ritual? To make trying something new less scary, they have a 100% money back guarantee if you don't love it. So head over to ritual.com slash ICH to get your essential proteins today. And if you're an iced coffee hour listener, you actually get 10% off your first three months. 10% off? 10% off. Oh all. my god! All they got to do is go to ritual.com slash ICH. Trust me, guys. I love this stuff. Thank you so much, Ritual, for sponsoring this episode and back, back to the, the podcast. podcast. And I was like, nah, no one's going to read my blog post. You know, instead, that's when I'm like, I can't beat them. Join them. I'm going to start going, you know, I'm going to start using these leveraged ETFs with stock options on top of them to do some crazy things and then let people, you know, let, let, let people become outraged on how we use this. And, 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 and that's how you, you'll end up starting this dialogue. Right. And that's why I called it wall street bets is I wanted to, to make a statement there that this is the casino, right. And this is a lot of fun that ethos continued to grow, which is, also is right around the time when Bitcoin started also mm -hmm. a similar language and philosophy in mind, right? With like F the central bank and the whole system. But anyways, but this is where we're, we're hoping to spark a conversation. So throughout this entire time, you get, you fast forward to this moment where these people take on risk that they cannot handle, right? Like, well, I don't have that money. Like, uh, you know, it's, uh, if, 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 uh, if the banks were able to do this in 2008, they didn't have the money and they got bailed out. I was like, well, then come get me. I got, I don't have a million dollars to see. This is now your problem. It's the typical, if you owe the dollar, the bank a dollar, it's your problem. And if you owe them a million, it's theirs. Like mm -hmm. this is kind of that. And that continued through well, today. And then obviously with yeah. GameStop and these other the philosophies. So do you worry that it's leaning a little bit too much into gambling versus investing? Oh, that's a great question. Um, no, no, no. Like, so you have, you have putting your money and hoping that you get returns as a thing, right? And then you get to def you get to pull different levers, and then you get to put a spectrum. And on one end, you're going to have what, pro what you're probably meaning by investing, which is low risk. Let's diversify. This is wealth growth and compound interest in your dividend collection stuff. Okay. And then on the other hand, and then you can start doing some higher risk things, maybe actually picking out your own portfolio, individually taking stocks and whatever it is, and continue working your way up. As, as risk starts increasing, uh, so is your potential return, obviously. And then you have what we're calling gambling, right? Which is ultra high risk, right? Like low probability, but, but really high impact, potentially uh, speculation. So there is there is your your spectrum, and along the way, everybody is guessing, right? Like Warren Buffett obviously is a great investor, but he gets it wrong sometimes too, right? Like the airlines and COVID was a great example with it. So he takes his little loss and whatever, and call it a day. But his his approach is is one that requires decades. 
this other one is just you're just pulling it up. And so you're speculating from both ends of it is how much am I willing to lose or how much do I want to make? And then you can even make a justice. You can get uh, you can make it um, you, you can gamble responsibly. Right. If if you have one hundred thousand dollars and you go to someone like, dude, don't do these out of the money stock options because you're going to lose your money. It's like, yeah, I could lose 100% of my money, but I'll take 1,000 of those dollars, put them on this side of the spectrum, and I'll take the other 99 over here. I've seen multiple times people take $1,000, turn it into $100,000 overnight, all right? So was that risking, or was that super intelligent, diversified approach mm -hmm. to you know, was money risk management? Luck. Like, it, it of course, been, there's yeah, luck. Yeah. No, 100% luck. Yeah, and, and the incredible amount of luck. Uh, but still, it happens. And it's like, well, worst case scenario, which was the most likely, I would have had $99,000 left. Right. And then I got, I hit the jackpot. And so now I have twice as much money as I started with. It's irresponsible to take the $100,000 and do yeah, that yeah. with it. Right. That's interesting because it's exactly the same as what, well, not exactly the same, but very similar to what. Uh, ask Sebi said when he came on our podcast, he said, was, this, no, it was beat the bush. Yeah. He said that you should place your bets. Obviously, you know, you should be doing the long-term, you know, growth investing and stuff like that. But at the same time, it is important on occasion to put some money here, put some money there that could potentially, you know, explode and, and, you know, skyrocket your account if you want to become yeah. that type of wealthy. So mm -hmm. here's, here's a cool thing right before coronavirus, one of the things that, that, uh, let to be being removed. I was, I, I said to myself, all right now this is big, and I wanted to start this conversation. We've already had it a few times with the infinite margin, like you had a, a handful of events. Now let's take it to the next level. I really want to see people on TV mad about the situation. So yeah. I'm going to rent out a casino, like one of those you know concert venues, a, a place. I'm going to do this competitive day trading like a tournament type thing where you have 10 or 12 competitors on stage on the front. I was like an esports <laughs> tournament, right? Trading live with the actual stock market oh my gosh. and YOLOing the crap out of this. So it's going to, it's going to have the format of a video game tournament, like these esports. That's things. amazing. I would, live yeah, it. I would watch that. Yeah. Gosh. PPV. Yeah. Do what you just you no. give everyone 10 grand. And and you like, get, no, no, no. You know, yeah. like, I mean, there's a lot of laws around that. So the, the, mecha the gosh. We, we, I, yeah. I actually created, this thing i had it all set up so I'm, I'm familiar very well with what the restrictions are but even more than that it was like let's take a dave portnoy and a jim kramer and uh, you know if you saw oh, david's yeah. like you know we call it trading spaces the homeless guy from the street like just <laughs> get a little bit of everything just to see you yeah know, to see what wins if if you want chris moneymaker for that first world series of poker wasn't a good poker player but it was fun to watch and he you know and he, and he won because he was lucky obviously there's luck so let's just you know do this yellow thing and 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 no other place than in a casino right because i want the world to know that we're playing with the stock market from las vegas um then coronavirus came and it killed my dreams but now i'm bringing it back and that's going to happen much bigger this time around because um let's just see some opportunities opened up. i want an invite to that yeah, i want to see that, that, that sounds incredible yeah. yeah absolutely so how do you oh so how do you feel wall street bets has changed investing because i think very much it's it shifted away for, it, it almost seems like now people are um no longer interested in safe fundamental stocks because they're like why would i wait a year to make seven percent when all of these other people are trading momentum stocks now or meme stocks and they're making that in a few hours it's, it's a great question. It's, it's not that Wall Street bets created that. Is that these people cr were created before Wall Street bets? There's an entire mindset in this generation, like millennials on down, where they were impacted by this 2008 financial crisis, and it was the banks that made them graduate college with huge loans and you know no, no prospect for a job, and maybe move into their parents' basement, and maybe their parents lose their house. Like it's just very few opportunities, and you can see that even to this day, millennials and Gen Z they have it worse off than their parents did. Like if you were to make a comparison, they're having kids later, et cetera. So you have this kind of distrust to the system, this this mindset that starts creating like this gig economy that leads to uber or whatever you know becoming influencers online let's let's hustle let's, let's try to make some money on the side because i'm I, I have to fend for myself right so that mentality starts creating itself right there and then people say okay well there you have the stock market and we know that it, it's just wild because it can go up or down and people tinker with it all the time like 
not too long ago, several months ago, that was the, um, I forget what the name of this company was. Some, some fund was being insanely irresponsible with derivatives and they ended up like spooking uh, the entire stock market and dropped Viacom's uh, stock price by 50%. Nothing to do with Viacom. It just had to do with derivatives and this domino effect. I forget their name. Um, and, uh, and it's like, well, but, but Viacom, their, their fundamentals are the same. Why did this thing drop 50%? They, they didn't announce any news. It was some other irresponsible player that had this domino effect that, that, that created this thing. So it's like, well, I'm going to go in and out and I'm going to use it to can't beat them. Join them. That philosophy has kind of continued up until this day. My, my personal thing about wall street is I actually, unlike popular belief, I love wall street. I love the system. I just think it needs fixing to some extent, right? Like the the purpose for these things existing is to raise capital for companies, right? People forget about that. But the other, you know, just a a couple of weeks ago, I had a a Reuters um, journalist say, hey, AMC, the stock is up because everyone's talking about this thing. And the CEO just announced they're going to do an additional offering. And in the prospectus, it says these stocks are not worth what you say, you know, what people are paying for them. So he admits they're, that he's scamming people. And then he says there's going to be a larger supply, thereby supposedly reducing the price. And then people still bought it and the price even went higher. Like what, what's, what's happening here? Isn't this crazy? Do you worry that it's ever going in the direction of being like a pump and dump where everyone collectively gets together and say, hey, we like this stock, we're just gonna buy it up. And if all of us buy a thousand dollars worth, we could influence the price this much and we just gotta sell. I do. Um, I like. Not that I worry that it's going to happen. It's more. Uh, it's more. I'd like it to not turn into th- that. Be turned into the conversation, uh, because then it's not productive anymore, and then it's it's actually counterproductive to the system, right? Like one of the greatest things about the market is price discovery. So more people that are in it, the more efficient that process can be. So I think that you uh, that that if you have people thinking they're going to make a quick buck by pushing the prices around, then then I'd like for that to not happen, but it cannot happen that easily. What we saw with GameStop is so much more than just a pump and dump. Like it's easy to say these guys like the stock and these guys were shorting it a lot and it was a short squeeze and it was just very sophisticated surgical maneuver with luck and all these different things. They try that with Apple or whatever, it's not gonna happen. They try that with penny stocks, that will, right? But that was one of the reasons why when I started Wall Street Bets, it was like no penny stocks because that that's too easy. Um, and then, then eventually we ended up increasing the bar to, I forget what the, it was both the stock price and the market cap amount just to, just to prevent that kind of dialogue. Um, it's not, not productive and it's also going to get unwarranted attention. Yeah. Did you yourself get in on GameStop AMC? No. Um, Uh, No, I I live in Mexico right now. And so ever since I moved in Mexico, moving money from my U.S. broker to Mexico and back, like it's just such a pain in the butt. And then taxes become really complicated. So I stopped trading individual stocks and stock options since since I got there in 2014. I now do like futures and Forex. You know, like I do my bets Mm -hmm. where I can do it easily. Why do you why do you move to Mexico and where do you move from? I was in D.C. in the last place. But in the U.S., I've lived in D.C., Chicago, like Salt Lake City, Utah. I've moved around a bit. Um, I was actually born in Mexico, and I lived there until I was like 12, 13. Always wanted to go back. Opportunity popped up. Went down there for a little bit, and I was like, I like it here. So cool. I stayed. But you yeah. still do YOLO bets. Yeah. But with just futures and other, other yeah, things. I use different instruments. And do you, do you, you can't use Robinhood anymore? I can. Do you use it? No, no, I don't use any U.S. broker. Like I oh, have, right, right, right. I have brokers that have my investments non yolo So everything got rolled up at the either E Trade or a TD Ameritrade. So all my brokers that I have are now those two. <laughs> and what do you think of the gamification of trading on Robinhood? I think it's great. Right, you have. Well, first of all, I'm going to say having confetti animations or whatever is not going to force somebody to buy stocks. I, I, I don't know. Really, I, I hate to interrupt. I liked the confetti. I it's miss. Great. Remember, those are the good old days when you yeah. got a free stock and you scratched it off. I loved it. I like the confetti. I too. loved it. I like it too. Yeah, it's I love cool, it. Right? Right? But it's, not, it's, it's fun. But you're not going to go out there and buy it. You, you enjoy it. So if you have to pick between brokers to YOLO with, maybe you're like, <laughs> I like the one with confetti. Yeah. Right. You've already made your decision to YOLO. Right. right. Like, and so... Uh, 
so I don't think that that in itself encourages the crazy behavior. I think that that decision is made. It's go, it's either made or going to be made throughout the natural progression of these people's adventures in the stocks. Uh, but I think that it's great because it educates people. If you if you buy a stock in Tesla, you're like I just mm -hmm. bought a share, right? And now I'm hoping to get rich. I'm going to check the stocks today. It's up 2%. Cool. That's exactly what it was supposed to do. Next day it goes down 2%. Like, why is it going down? Right. Like, what is the news? You know, when it goes up, it's no big deal. But when it goes down, there's got to be news, right? You start looking it up and they can't find any news on Tesla. But then they're like, all right, there's this dude called Powell, J J J Jerome Powell. He's talking about some interest rate. What does that have to do with anything, right? Next thing you know, they're understanding monetary mm -hmm. policy and what it has to do with the interest rates and how these things are interconnected in the bond yields or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden you have a person that's become educated because of their two percent you know in tesla that's that's one example maybe it doesn't go that crazy but but once you have that stock in your thing so the gamification process encourages that process it's not scary right. there's confetti scratch your thing off click the button in fact robin hood is funny because they the stock options which are trickier uh or they can be trickier than regular stocks uh, definitely it can be, they can, they can be intimidating when you open an options chain on a regular broker and you have like a gazillion numbers that are flashing. Robinhood says, all right, you want a stock option? Sure. No problem. Do you think the stock's going to go up or down? Yeah, it's and then you answer with the arrow, <laughs> with the color coded arrow. It's like, I, so they make it so easy. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so they don't even have an option, option chain. It no, looks different. You like buy, down. sell, call, put. Yeah. It's just like any other option they chain. Explain is just it like, so well. I have to say, yeah. uh, I didn't understand options, but when you go through Robinhood, do you think it's going to go up or down? Down. When do you think it's going to go down? This date. How much do you think it's going to go down? This much. There you go. That's what you want. That's, I mean, that's wonderful. You don't have to know Black Scholes pricing model. Like it's and it's and it's cool because it's like, whoa, why did this thing go down so much, right? Like or up so much or whatever it is. And so that's that's cool because it encourages experimentation and fun and learning and 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 I, I think it's a it's it's like a gateway drug <laughs> for people yeah. that want to learn are, more. But are you concerned though? I think I think the problem with gamification is that uh, from the SEC's perspective. Robinhood is, is gamifying a system that benefits the more the users trade. And generally, the more users trade, the more money they lose at Robinhood's benefit. Yeah. Do you think that well, there's any sort of conflict of interest no, there? No, no, no. Robinhood, I, I followed everything up until the losing at Robinhood's benefit. Yeah. Re, Robinhood is indifferent as to whether you lose money. They will make their, they well, will make their money from number of trades. Yes. Well, let, let me clarify that. Um, generally, the more people trade, the more likely Correct. they are to lose. Yes. So by Robinhood encouraging users to trade Correct. more at their benefit, statistically, yes. people are more likely to lose money. There you go. So uh, th is there a perverse incentive? No, because... Well, first of all, there's a lot of criticism towards the the encouraging. So the first thing is, how do they encourage a lot of trading by making them free, right? And so then that that takes us to this payment for order flow concept. And so then you're starting questioning execution of these things. Mm -hmm. And I don't, as a sub part of your question, I don't really care about, like, I, I don't think that payment for order flow is bad. The rules are such that the payment for order flow have to give you the same or better prices than you would on the exchange. So the yeah. prices themselves are good. This whole front running thing is like silly. Um, I personally, I don't like payment for order for myself because I need a fast execution. I need pennies on the dollar. I do like charts. I'm more technical than meme stock or, or yellow type stuff. Uh, so I choose to pay a commission for my trades because that's what works for me. You take Keith Gill, it takes 50,000 grand and turn it into $50 million. Like these guys don't care if you got stiffed a couple of cents on this thing because their approach is a different one that suits them. So, so on the payment for order flow standpoint, not really worried. The let's encourage a lot of activity on there. Uh, it, it, I think that as long as people are aware that what they are doing is risky, which oftentimes they do, especially after they lose money, then, then it's on these individuals. There's, there's gamblers, right? There's, there's a, a, like an addiction of gambling and mm -hmm. gamblers anonymous. And those people have a problem. And that problem is usually, Hey, this activity is now affecting the livelihood of you and your family, whatever it is go get some help those people exist whether they be in vegas or whether they be on the stock market for the majority of people they say i lost money that hurt i don't want to do that again so some people are so risk averse they're like never again close it and uninstall the app and call it a day 
for a lot of people is like, no, 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 no. I think I can learn from this thing, right? Like, I think I can do it better next time, as was the case with me. I would make tons of money and I would lose tons of money. And when I make tons of money, I would start seeing dollar signs. I'm like, I just need to do that six more times and I'll have $600 million, right? Like, mm -hmm. because if you do the math and, you know, and then of course you can't do that six more times. And so eventually the the trajectory that at least I took was from like crazy risk to more systematic. And so then it's all of a sudden things about risk management and, and you know, putting a little bit more science to it. And, uh, and that's the name of the game. What did I walk away with? Even if I had lost money, I walked away with tons of knowledge. I am now a better fundamental investor, right? because of that natural curiosity than, than most people would probably imagine. So what are your own personal investments looking like? I'm a boring investor. So I have like S and P and the NASDAQ, it's a little bit heavier. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it on the U S side, right? And that's what percentage would you say that is of you? what of just like of total your portfolio. total portfolio? Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question. I would probably say 20%. Okay. And yeah. then the other 80. <laughs> you want to hear the good stuff? stuff? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have see. I have a Build a bear. <laughs> no, there is, there is, uh, you know, li liquid, like a savings or whatever it is with the bank. We have real estate. We have crypto, which is something I've gotten really heavy into. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and then other investments, uh, a very large part in private equity, right? Like, these are the, the, uh, pre IPO type investments. Now I know this may seem like a silly question, but how do you yourself make money? Uh, I make money in lots of different ways. So I have. This is a casino, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do make money with trading, right? So, um, but, but it's no longer the thing that I sit there all day long doing, right? Like just the long-term trade stuff? No, 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 trading short-term stuff. Like that, that, I now just go into the high propensity. I've, I've seen this enough times and lost enough money to know that there are some really big opportunities. That even in regular investing, you know that like this is the go all in moment because mm -hmm. the stocks are down 50%, like pandemic last year, 2008, da, 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 da. that thing happens for more frequently with trading where it's like, whatever your style is. I'm like, this is a three times a year type situation. I'm going to put a lot of money on this bet. Right. And then it's very high propensity to pay out like, you know, over 90% and, and, and the returns are insane. So, and then there's smaller ones of those opportunities that come in. And so if I'm happen to be on my phone and I'm checking these things and my setups are there, or I feel that there's a short term thing, I'll go in there and that, that generates a, a fair amount of money, but I'll do that maybe anywhere between one to four times a month. That's all that it really takes to do that. And then, uh, but that's boring. And I don't want to just do that all day long. So the things that I make money from is I do speaking arrangements. I wrote a book and probably writing another one. I'm doing this Las Vegas thing. Uh, this, the, um, what do you call it? The, the competitive day trading thing that turned into, because of the regulations, this is kind of cool. The SEC, it turns out, is not that much of a impediment to doing this. It's more the FCC. So I want to pay the winner a million bucks. And so in order to do that, you have to, you know, you can't give it to your buddies to be competitors. And I would need to make sure it's fair. So then that created an entire reality TV show that, that's attached to it. Right. So I just signed with a really big production company that's going to, to, to handle that. So you have your reality TV show leading up to the final event. And so that's a, a, a money maker there, you know, like, the movie that I created, uh, making deals with, um, uh, the crypto, um, is, is a good one I've created. So I, I, um, now getting big into crypto, but I still, my passion is wall street. And I know that those two things are emerging. So I've created this platform that is combining crypto with, um, regular stocks or traditional mm -hmm. finance. So you can now actually invest from the crypto side into the stock market and create these kind of, I want to, <laughs> this is a tiny little tangent, but I think it's exciting, right? Like to showcase the technology of what it is that we created on the crypto side. Uh, you guys know what the ETFs are, I assume, mm -hmm. right? So ETFs, they have to, if you want to rebalance them, like to make an e-meme stock ETF, you have to like file with the SEC and you have to pay money and wait and they approve it and whatever. And then eventually they, you can do that on the fly on the blockchain without having to do any of these things. So I'm, creating an ETF that'll trade on the stock market. 
the, whose sole underlying is an ETP, which is what we're calling exchange traded portfolios. It's like a blockchain version of it. And that blockchain version ETF, all it does is it copies the greatest investment couple of our generation, Nancy Pelosi and company. <laughs> it's excellent. Like they're, they're, <laughs> 20 they, million proven, stock market. They've yeah. proven they have 112% annualized return with 12% drawdown. They have really impeccable stats. You can now trade real time with that. And so uh, that's but now, when you mean real time, <laughs> aren't we seeing with within yeah. a 30 day window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you won't be able to get their exact returns. Yeah. You know, if they happen to have incredible luck with timing, you know, because sometimes politicians can be really, really lucky yeah. with timing. Maybe you're not going to get that exact little bump, but you'll be able to get. I would love that. Honestly, <laughs> we should be able to. That should. Th here's the thing, because recently they've wanted to. Uh, they, I think they've actually just banned uh, uh, policymakers from buying individual stocks. And I don't know if they passed that or not. I have I, I have I to go look. I think they just did. <laughs> okay. And they've uh, so basically they could they could buy individual stocks, but they have to give 45 days notice to the public, and it has to be approved. Oh. They, that's oh, good for you. They have to, they have to, they have to hold that investment for a year, and if they want to sell again, another forty-five days notice, and it has to be approved. But those are under special circumstances. But otherwise, they must buy into a mutual fund or an ETF that tracks the broad market. That was that's just something funny. that I covered, believe it or not, on yeah, Friday's video, yeah. and I covered it Friday's, Friday's video because it came out Thursday night. Okay, that's probably, and, probably why I haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah okay. And I titled my video "Banned from Investing." But here's so, the thing, yeah. about it. I, I don't know enough about this, so I'm, yeah. so I'm gonna try not to say too much about it, but I'll, I'll say what I've seen in the past with these things. Like yeah. this insider trading thing has, is not new, it's happened forever, right? And the first time that I saw it, I was outraged. Like some, some um, Congress people, they were buying property in some state right before they approved the railroad to go through it, what, you know, like inside information, maybe it wasn't the stock market, and same outrage, people get really upset. So they passed the law of no insider trading fairness act of America of whatever year it is and what the rules say is you can no longer buy like property in the state of wyoming you know between the days of whatever 2005 and 2006 if you were about to pass a law about a real like it was just very specific yeah. to do not repeat that one particular maneuver again uh and i'm inclined to think that the but now i have to go read it before yeah. i speak I, I i guess i'm hoping that the rule is actually the way that you've described it yeah. like once once the fine print is in because that would be the fair thing uh, but in the meantime, I'm still really excited about the the prospect of being able to mimic because I still think that the Congress uh, has the ability to be better traders than the general Americans. And so anyway, so I so I make money with that related stuff. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, I don't know. I still now, have that entrepreneur. Speaking spirit. of that, I, I found this to be a very interesting video. This uh, this guy, Nob Jaws over at Market Sentiment, he analyzes all of these stocks and uh, including the stocks on Wall Street Bets. He's he's the one who's put together in the past this entire spreadsheet analyzing the mentions, the daily mentions of every single stock on Wall Street Bets and then analyzing its performance. This guy is incredible. But he looked at the past performance of Congress members mm -hmm. and determined that overall they do beat the S&P 500 by a little bit. Uh, but it's skewed by the by the few people like the Pelosi's who end up doing really well. But most people who copy these within 30 days barely beat the S&P 500. It's by like 1%. And it's not worth over 10,000 different trades copying them, except it's like, the you know, the top five, I think. Where, so so here's, yeah. here's what's an interesting, right? Like as we're, because this is happening, by yeah. the way, this isn't just a joke. And, and, and doing that and in doing all these filings and work on these things, they're like, all right, well, what happens if Pelosi resigns, right? Like, you know, amongst yeah. many other different things. And so the way that we're solving that is something that goes in that direction where it's like, well, that's okay. I have my, my ledger here of, of potential politicians, right? Like, and these are their stats, like if they're baseball players and this one right here, they, and you can see all their past performance and then you can just kind of, uh, uh, this thing happens on the blockchain. There's like a governance based thing, mm -hmm. people vote community, whatever. And so basically the, the, the community is gonna take a vote and select the new politician that's going to be the key winner. So that, you know, I, I do figure that if you take everyone as an average, you have like 435 Congress people plus 100 senators. I mean, you have like five, over 500 people. You're probably going to get an average uh, as an average. But yeah, I think that people are going to go yeah. for the ones that have a, a better well, track record. What are your thoughts about alternative investments, whether that be NFTs, art, collectibles? What are your thoughts on that? I made the mistake of assuming that crypto was Bitcoin 
or whatever coin for too long. Like I, I knew exactly what it was at the beginning. I even had, you know, gotten into it myself. Never made it part of Wall Street bets because the execution, the difficulty of getting involved was just too high. And I never reevaluated that stance. And I regret not doing that because because the crypto is so much more than just coins, right? Yeah. Like it is an entire system that is mind baffling and I could do an entire hour just on that. But the, so, so I start seeing these NFTs and I start seeing these rocks going for a million dollars and I can make quick assumptions about it and say, okay, the tulip mania, we got in a situation here, uh, but I'm not gonna make that mistake again. So I'm gonna go in there and I'm actually gonna buy some NFTs and see what it's about. Um, and I think, there is definitely some serious staying power there. It's incredibly fascinating. NFTs, uh, the, the, the core definition, non-fungible tokens, are just like a data file that has information in it and it's on the blockchain and you can do a lot of stuff with it. Now, it's, they're currently, their use is currently associated with, here's a picture of this pixelated whatever, you know, sell it for a lot of money. But that's not what the technology is. That is one use of that application. The actual NFT application, I think, has tremendous investment potential. I touched on the uh, fractionalized real estate. You know, I was, I probably shouldn't say who, but there's a very f high profile, famous real estate individual, you know, who approached me. He's like, dude, we, we need to marry these NFTs with real estate. And, uh, and, and because I had this preconceived notion, I'm like, this is a really cool thing. People can just buy little pieces of it. You have the art, you have the, I, I drew my Picasso and I can sell it. I think that's really cool too. And and then you have the other one that's currently in existence is the you know 10,000 pre-generated, let's make a community and sell it to them. I, you know, there's, we're also in a heated situation where there's a lot of money flowing in a lot of excitement that's going to die off. There's going to be some stuff, but like, you know, I was talking about regulation, uh, uh, with, I could say who Brittany Kaiser, she's like the, the, uh, whistleblower at Cambridge Analytica. And we were talking about other crypto stuff and, and she's got this, um, you know, she's trying to get into the lobbying world and she's got all these things registered. I'm like, why don't you give the office of the congressperson, an NFT. You tell that congressperson, this NFT is programmed that it's going to give you every month $1 million to the owner of this NFT, so long as the mechanism by which you can receive that million dollars continues to be legal, right? That's the rule, right? So it's like this automatic lobbying contraption where you don't have to call and whine and mm -hmm. dine, whatever. You're, you know, the people that are in the House of Representatives, specifically the two-year term people, they just do campaigning all year long. Like it's incredible. So you don't have to campaign anymore. Here's your money. Just make sure that you don't pass any laws that prevents that from happening because then we don't want to break the law and we'll have to yep. shut off your NFT. Like cool stuff there. Thank you so much Thank for coming awesome. on. Really it's fantastic this. meeting you. Yeah, no, likewise. This is a lot of fun. This is probably the most prompt uh, podcast we've ever done in terms yeah. of like, Start starting and starting right on time, ending right on time. I want to respect your time. <laughs> thank you. And I uh, really it. appreciate you coming on. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, make sure to subscribe. Oh, you want to tell them to hit the like button? You just got to hit the like button. <laughs> 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 subscribe and make sure to get your free stock down below in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching and until next time. Thanks. Cool. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate that.